This program contains coarse language. No one likes a snitch, whether it's the creeps or the government. Nobody. Law enforcement couldn't fight crime without them. I was told to lie, I was told to cheat, I was told to steal. We are just trying to get through the day by day, you know, without getting a, uh, you know, a bullet to the head or, or, or tortured or um, something uh, happening to my family. To the police, they're known as human sources and undercover operatives. They help keep the country safe. Human sources are probably one of the only ways to effectively take out the top end of organised crime. And they secure the critical evidence to bring down Australia's crime kingpins. There's a contract to pack 100 kilos of rack. After the politicians and police take the credit, some say they're abandoned in the shadows. You're basically imprisoned like the people that you help put behind bars. Bring me home. Bring me home. For the first time, we talked to a confidential human source, an undercover operator, and a handler about the true cost of fighting crime. Are authorities doing enough to protect them? to know what they do behind closed doors. They don't want it known. Because you lose integrity when you're worse than the people that you're investigating. I've been speaking to someone who worked as a confidential source for Australian and American law enforcement agencies for more than two years. I told the Australians repeatedly which authorities in Mexico, because I'm heavily connected with the cartel, are compromised and which ones are not. Now, he's on the run. The more information I gave, the more dangerous it become. If I've disappeared for more than 24 hours, I'm gone. They can only either arrest me or make it look like an accident. We planned to meet up with the informant in Europe, but just before we took off, we found out he was arrested in Hungary. hoping to find out why he's been arrested and whether his extraordinary story checks out. My colleague Meghna Bali and I head to the apartment where he was arrested. He was making a living from crime here but his friends don't know about his double life as an informant. This whole floor got full of a police force, you know? And they all had shields and they all had guns. And then they This woman's boyfriend was also arrested during the raid. And they start yelling to put our hands up. So I just, I didn't want to move because I, I felt like they were going to shoot us if we were to even move. This is my contact in handcuffs. His name, Miles Mehta, alias Milesh Talreja, also known as Marco Ciccarella. I could hear from here, like, uh, he's, he was yelling at them, I need a lawyer, I need to speak to my lawyer, Mr. Wagner. Miles's friend is also wanted by the police. 
Did you hear anybody speaking English or in any accents? I saw only one guy speaking in good English accent. Only one guy. And he was in civil dress. And when you say he was, had an English accent, was it English or American? American. American accent. Okay. And then the guy said, it's an FBI investigation. You don't need to worry about anything. Miles had been dreading this day. What are you supposed to do when you're that far gone? All of a sudden you've got an Interpol red notice on your hand and the American government's looking for you. Miles is wanted for bank fraud in the United States. He was convicted three years ago, but fled before sentencing. For people that have never met him, what does he look like? How does he dress? What kind of personality does he have? He's always in his Louis Vuitton shoes, for sure. And he, he likes to dress to impress all the time. What do you think he likes about dressing up like that? Um, he says he's a boss, so he likes to dress like one. <laughs> Honestly. Do you think he is a boss, or? <laughs> I think he's crazy. <laughs> but, um... I do think he is what he says. He is what he says. Now that Miles is in prison, he needs people to believe him more than ever. But that will be an uphill battle. They use people like me because of the plausible deniability. It's really, really, really hard to listen to someone with my history and to immediately believe them over the police. Fact-checking a self-confessed fraudster and spy is tough. But let me tell you what we already know. Miles was raised on Sydney's North Shore and attended the elite private King's School in North Parramatta until 2007. I went to a private bloody school. I'm not supposed to be in this fucking world. I fucked up at 18 and here we are. His teenage fuck-up made for great tabloid fodder. He drove away from an Audi dealership with an $80,000 car. He defrauded individuals and businesses of $330,000. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and anxiety. And he was sentenced to seven months in jail. He told me he earned the respect of hardened crims because he already knew a lot about finance, banking, and the law. When you put somebody like me, who is criminal enough to come across as a criminal, but educated enough to come across as the top end of town, they're very interested in having you around. Miles left Australia in 2010, running from outstanding fraud charges. Over the next eight years, he'd continue to make a living of financial crime while adopting different identities. I did the wrong thing. I was involved in all sorts of frauds and money laundering related shit. And it's because of all that that I started to make friends with and be introduced to a lot of these significantly higher level underworld people. So how do you go from being a criminal to working for the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. Essentially, they went to my mother and they said, we're aware that your son is involved with all sorts of people and does all sorts of things and we'd like to speak to him. We think we can bring him back to Australia. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, or ACIC, gathers intelligence for law enforcement it can offer human sources a financial reward or help with any charges they face. For Miles, it was a promise to come home. And then the more they started speaking to me, the more they realised that I had access into these levels of people, the more the goalposts kept being moved. Miles was reporting to the ACIC about the kingpins of Australia's drug trade. Hakan Ayik, Charlie Gigi, Angelo Pandelli, Hakan Arif, and George Dibb. 
Australia's most wanted on the run overseas. I intended to cooperate and do the best I could from minute one. It was about wholesale change, right? If you're going to cross the line, you're going to do it properly. So part of that was that you've got to tell them everything yeah. all the time, right? I told them about this character that I'd come across. Miles says he'd met a man in a London jail, allegedly linked to one of the world's most notorious narco-terrorists, Dawood Ibrahim. And they came back to me very, very quickly, very quickly. We want a couple of our friends of ours from the United States to have a word with you. This is uh, of significant interest to the United States. Significant interest. And that's when Miles says the ACIC introduced him to America's Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. According to these public American court documents from April 2019, Miles worked on operations with the DEA overseas, traveling hundreds of thousands of miles. Miles eventually arrived in New York. For six months, he'd been collecting evidence about transnational drug trafficking for the DEA. He says they promised to help him get permanent residency. It never happened. Good morning, Eileen. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Sure, I'm just going to turn the volume up a bit. Let's see here. Soon after, needing money and experiencing manic episodes, Miles committed another fraud. Eileen Jaroslaw was his attorney. He wasn't being paid a salary or a stipend uh, by law enforcement. Eileen tells me Miles was charged for writing a cheque for 500,000 US dollars from an account that had less than $6,000 in it. And he wrote it, no less, in purple highlighter. It's bizarre, I've seen the cheque. Um, it wasn't written with a pen, it wasn't written with even a Sharpie, a marker, it was purple highlighter. On February 5th of, of 2020, um, we got the call that, that he was in custody. And Miles had stolen around $116,000 of the available funds. He pleaded guilty to fraud. He was incarcerated pre-trial, and it was under the most horrendous conditions. The corrections officers there would bring in drugs and guns for the people there. It was, it was hellacious. Eileen was a federal prosecutor for 20 years and has worked with a lot of human sources as well as law enforcement agencies like the DEA. She's shocked that Miles' service didn't seem to count for anything and the DEA dropped him as a source because of the bank fraud. He felt betrayed that he had taken great personal risk in assisting in building important narcotics cases. They just cut him loose. I think he genuinely thought his life was in danger. Fearing for his safety, he fled the United States. In his absence, in September 2020, Miles Mehta was sentenced to 37 months in prison. I want to learn more about the blurred lines between human sources and law enforcement. How much scrutiny is placed on the authorities that manage them? It's a difficult area to investigate because everything happens in secret. Good evening, Mahmoud. Good evening, yes, it's, it's nightfall here. So I reach out to a leading expert in this field. There was always a very negative connotation put around people who passed information to the police. In fact, we're very much indoctrinated in, in, in school. You know, don't be a tattletale. John Buckley has 28 years of experience in counter-terrorism and intelligence gathering. The whole attitude has changed. These people are seen as being a very, very valuable resource. They're always... He advises law enforcement agencies around the world, including Australia. And 
the ethical guidelines are, are there much greater in a, in a much greater way. We've spoken to a source who was recruited by the ACIC and then passed on to the DEA. What can you tell us about the way those two organizations treat and manage their human sources? Um, if, I, if, I, if I said to you that it, it's a bit like comparing I'm sitting in daylight and you're sitting in darkness. Um, ACIC is a professional organization that manages human sources in accordance of the standards that I would expect from any other law enforcement agency in Australia. Law enforcement, when it comes to managing human sources in the United States of America, is 20 years behind Australia. A source has utility. I will use that person, and then when I'm finished using them, I'll move on and get another one. This is the behavior I John knows human sources don't always get what they're promised by their handlers, the officers responsible for assessing their intelligence and keeping them safe. Miles claims his ACIC handlers strung him along with verbal promises to help him get back to Australia. So a source we've spoken to um, alleges that his handlers made him offers and then reneged or even perhaps fabricated the offers that were presented to him. What do you make of that? You are not in a position to promise something that you cannot give, that you cannot guarantee you will give. Certainly the professionals that I work with would not be saying that. I'd be absolutely stunned if they would say that. Back in Hungary, we're on a mission with Miles's criminal associate. Your mum's calling you. What work does your mum think you're doing? I told them that I work in a bakery in Switzerland, and that's what she thinks. We're on our way to neighbouring Slovenia to get Miles's old phones. He says they're key to understanding what motivated him to work for the ACIC and DEA. He also says they contain critical evidence he was exploited by handlers at the agencies. So do you think this guy we're going to meet is nervous? Um, probably he will feel comfortable meeting with me by myself. It might not look like it, but Maribor is a key destination in the smuggling networks run by organised crime. Hello. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll be alone. Okay, I'm going, they're here. All right. Good luck. See ya. I'm really hoping we can get access to these phones because without them, it's going to be really hard to verify the extraordinary claims our source has made. Have a seat, bro. Sure. Thanks. How'd you go? Oh, yeah, I got the phones. They were not really happy to hand over. Yes. Do you want to pass me sure. the phones? Yeah, this the oldest. And that's not the new, but... It turns out that the phones do contain critical evidence that supports Miles' story.
There's a video of a brick of cocaine. Crucially, we find Miles' encrypted chats with his handlers at the ACIC, and even phone calls he recorded with them. Along with a bunch of other personal files, these confirm much of what he's told us about his work with the ACIC and DEA. What did he give you? What was the detail? We've recreated their calls, changing the voices of the ACIC handlers. All he told me was, what did he say exactly? There's a contract to pack 100 kilos of rack. Could you move the cash, was the question. They show that on behalf of the ACIC, Miles was in contact with the so-called Aussie cartel, key figures in the drug trade. He was providing intelligence on the scale and destination of significant drug hauls, but lived in constant fear of having his cover blown. Your cover's solid because Dib backs you. Like, that's a massive backing. He's fucking staunch. He backs you totally. All right. You sure there's no leaks in your agency? The most startling thing we found on the phones was evidence to back up one of Miles' key claims that the ACIC continued to use Miles as a source at the same time American police were searching for him. We have no evidence that his handlers helped him escape the US, but they cheer the fugitive on as he crosses other international borders. The ACIC handlers appear to have no issues working with Miles, despite being wanted by US authorities. Messages show that at times the pressure would be too much for Miles. Eventually, when he tried to step away, the ACIC lured him back with a big promise. The handlers suggest the Australian Attorney General could protect Miles from extradition to the United States. We have no evidence the AG knew about or responded to these promises. I'm not concerned about fighting agencies. In, in one of the recorded calls, Miles's handler even tells him he can take care of the Interpol red notice that declares Miles a fugitive. The red notice I can get. If we get the results, I can easily get the red notice. We uncover another call with a different handler. This is the moment his worst nightmare is realised. Mate, I've just got a series of messages from... Okay. Can you understand the risk to my life that comes from this shit? After fleeing the US, Miles learned of a threat to his former DEA handler's life. He tells the ACIC. The message is relayed to the DEA. When the DEA handler finds out, he goes straight to the guy who made the threat. Miles freaks out that his cover's been blown to a man with alleged links to narco-terrorist Dawood Ibrahim. And what the fuck are the DEA doing going to the source of the person who's put a hit out asking if they've put a hit out? You think they're not going to work out where that came from? That information came from me. The DEA went and leaked it to the fucking source. Mate, it's... Absurd. Your intentions have been very forthright, protecting the life of this officer, and then they've gone and deliberately done actions which endangers yours. I can't believe it. I make the reasonable inference that the intention is to have me murdered by proxy. The following day, he speaks to his other ACIC handler, who makes his feelings about the DEA very clear. 
They're just fucking with you. Like, they're cunts. No question, they're cunts. How can any of you sleep at night giving the DEA anything anymore? Anything. Oh, this is run of the mill. Like, this is standard DEA. So putting informants at risk is just perfectly acceptable conduct? 100% is completely acceptable to them. Can, can you tell me, are, are there other active Australian citizens working for the DEA? Can't tell you that. Can you tell these other Australian citizens the risk that they face? Well, I can't say anything, but let me phrase it, obviously. In my eyes, things have changed, but it doesn't help you. Despite the scare, the ACIC continues to run him for eight months, before abruptly cutting Miles loose. They never tell him why. ACIC didn't respond to questions, and the DEA also declined to comment. The DEA handler, who has since retired, acknowledged there was a threat to his life, but claims he didn't know the tip came from Miles and didn't blow his cover. Handlers are used by both state and federal law enforcement agencies, managing human sources and undercover operatives who work inside criminal syndicates. As I investigate Miles' story, I realise how pivotal that role is. And I managed to meet up with one of the most experienced handlers in Australia. Hey Brad. How you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with us. We'll call this guy Brad. Sure, it's not something you do every day. To protect his identity, this is a reenactment of our conversation. As a handler, Brad managed sources and undercover operatives for major crime investigations. Look, there was definitely a, uh, a turning point around 2010, um, back towards using human sources. You know, we were really losing the war against organised crime because of these encrypted devices. I think the Australian criminals adapted to the surveillance better than anyone in the world in the way that they've, you know, taken to these dedicated encrypted devices. So when you've got no surveillance, you can't look from the outside in. You've got to find a way to be a part of them. And the solution to the problem was the simplest and the oldest method, and that's um, it's just using human sources. Can they traffic and use drugs in order to catch the people at the top? Yeah. Look, I can't answer that um, because it's part of our methodology, so I just... Sorry, I just can't answer that. Right, but how pivotal are human sources and undercover operators in this fight against organised crime? I guess they're the key weapon against organised crime. I don't think you'd find anyone in law enforcement that would argue that point. You know, against organised crime, human sources are the majority of the firepower for law enforcement. How common are they? Well, every level of organised crime are talking to law enforcement agencies nationally. Every level. I've had sources who have been providing information from inside organised crime for as long as 14 years. How dangerous does that get? Well, look, I know sources that have definitely got into some really hairy situations where their life's been threatened and, like, you know, they're maybe seconds from being killed. Why would they want to work for law enforcement? Well, there's some that become human sources out of revenge and they want to take out the competition. Uh, some of them want a way out of the life that they were in because they can't walk away. 
Uh, I think some in the past kind of have believed that they're going to be coming into great wads of cash. You know, they can be paid thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars at the highest levels of organised crime. And I guess, I don't know, some just want to balance the books. They've done so much bad in their life that they want to tip the scales in the other direction. So I guess what we can do is we can offer a letter of assistance. Like it's actually in the Sentencing Procedure Act. There's low level, medium level and high level of assistance. And they weigh up the risk that the source took and the benefit to the community which can result in up to a discount of 50% in sentencing. For Brad, the hardest part of the job is when an operation ends and the source is placed into a witness protection or WITSEC program. They're almost disappearing. I still remember every one of those days. It's almost like someone's died. You know, this, it's an unpopular opinion and I could get myself sacked, but you know, I'd rather go to jail for a couple of years than to go to WITSEC for 10. I still feel guilty about that part of my career. You know, putting people in WITSEC, like, that's the regretful part. It's like a necessary evil. You know, human sources are probably one of the only ways to effectively take out the top end of organised crime. There's someone I want to meet who feels the sacrifices he made as an undercover operator have gone unrecognised and unrewarded. Unlike Miles, he was employed by law enforcement and had no criminal background. He was involved in the investigation of major crime figures. To protect his identity, we've recreated our conversation with an actor. Blackwood, nice to meet you. Hey mate, how are you going? Come on in. Thank you very much. Tell us who you are. Who am I? Uh, <laughs> that's a difficult one without disclosing too many details. Um, I'm a person who is well educated uh, and well trained, uh, who come from a very disciplined background. Um, I don't know, you, you need to help me along here, mate. The strategies he used to infiltrate organised crime were taken from the same playbook used in many police operations. How do you meet these people? Uh, you mean the bump? Uh, well, when you bump into people and become their friend, uh, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, uh, hang around, splash a lot of cash, all that stuff, you, you know, and then become friends, you know, make yourself look appealing. You know, we call that the bump. It must be a bit exciting or thrilling. No, uh, you know, look, we're just trying to get through the day by day, you know, without getting a, uh, you know, a bullet to the head or, or beaten up or, or tortured or um, something uh, happening to my family. So, how do you win their trust? Now, sometimes you're acting like a concierge service. They've got plenty of money and all of a sudden you can give them things that they don't have access to. Do you have to do coke with them and all that sort of stuff? Uh, it's like the old saying, you don't, uh, you don't trust someone who doesn't drink. You know, if it's like you were to sell me some, some wine and I'd say I don't really want to taste it. You know, officially, that's, the official line is you don't. But I mean, obviously it goes without saying that you have to engage in those things and, uh, and more. What do you mean when you say, and more? Uh, well, <laughs> there's nothing illegal about um, a single guy having fun with women, is there? <laughs> uh, you're not allowed to sleep with sex work as well on the job? Not if you're paying for it, no. 
Because you can't build a taxpayer for that sort of thing. That's correct. In some investigations, police are given the power to break the law in order to catch criminals. My source says they'd ignore small drug shipments so they could catch commercial loads. You are... you turned a blind eye to that. How many kilos before you'd be like, look, we've got to let this through, but we need to have a discussion about it? If it's a couple of kilos here and there, they have to let it. You know, what you have to understand, uh, between black and white, there's a massive grey area. And that's the area we're, we're working within. I mean, that's not what people want to hear. They want to think that there's, you know, hard and fast rules, protocols, procedures, but the reality is life's not, life's not like that. Life's not black and white. We've even found details of the sale and supply of drugs by law enforcement in publicly available government reports. The undercover operator helped bring down organised crime figures. The threat to his life was imminent. He's been looking over his shoulder ever since. The day you stop, everything changes. You're basically imprisoned like the people that you helped put behind bars. Why have you decided to speak out? <sighs> what my expectations were versus what was delivered to me in terms of sacrifices that I made uh, were vastly different. You know, there's, there's so much secrecy around what we do that people don't even realise the sacrifices that, uh, that we make, you know, that we made. So basically, you know, once things are completely done, you're, you're forgotten about. You know, you're abandoned. You're abandoned by the government. You're abandoned by uh, the, the people you work with. You're abandoned by the people you trusted. And my family is saying, you promised these things would happen. You know, I made promises based upon promises that have been made to me by so many people that I trusted. You know, I, I don't want a medal on my chest. I don't want some big official like the PM to shake my hand. I just want to get out. I want to get out and live a normal life. You know, and unfortunately, that, that doesn't happen for any of us. And not only for us, but the people that are closest to you. Your family, your immediate family. Your loved ones, are, they carried on this journey with you. And they didn't, even, they didn't even sign up for it in the first place. Did you manage to mend the relationship with your family? Uh, the relationship broke down. Uh, we were all suffering mentally. I ended up attempting suicide. You know, you would think they would be there to help you on the, on the next part of your journey. You know, we have to fight every day for our rights. And on top of that, you have the mental struggles. It feels like anyone who plays a part in this world ends up in a prison of some kind. After three years on the run, former human source Miles Mehta is now fighting extradition to the United States from this Hungarian jail. For Miles, jail means more trauma. He's been assaulted and abused while locked up in the past. He's been imprisoned in nine different countries on multiple fraud charges. And now he wants to speak out about promises he says were made and broken by the ACIC and the DEA. So the first floor. First floor, sure. Thank you. Uh, that officer on that floor is the officer that absolutely beat the crap out of me.
I've been talking to Miles on the phone for a couple of months, but have only ever seen old photos of him. This will be the first time we meet face to face. Miles, how are you doing in there? Shit. So bad. It's so bad. Miles understands the potential consequences of telling me his story. Why are you prepared to take th that risk? Because I'm already a dead man. I'm a walking corpse. I'm not going to ever come out of this prison. And if I'm extradited to the United States, I'll be killed on arrival. Since we spoke, you've been uh, arrested and face extradition. Yes. What do you want the public to know about your situation? I would like to be extradited or deported or whatever it may be to Australia. It is time for me to go before a court. It is time for me to pay for my crimes, whatever they may be. What are those crimes? I am reliably advised that there are tax fraud warrants, other and other fraud related warrants, and I would be unsurprised if there are drug related warrants. I cannot confirm or deny if they exist. Why should the public believe your side of the story? Why make these allegations on television? Why admit that I am a spy or was a spy against people that would kill me quicker than they would brew their morning espresso if it weren't true? Why? Why would I say I am willing to return to Australia now when my sentence and exposure in Australia is maybe 30 years and my exposure in the United States is 37 months? Why? Why? What have you done for Australian law enforcement? What have you helped them achieve? My responsibility was to infiltrate and report everything that I heard, whether that was a national security matter or a drug related matter or a any related matter. What have I done? I believe that I have protected our community. I believe that I made mistakes, significant mistakes when I was young and that it was my opportunity to show law enforcement that I was prepared to repay my debt by placing my life at grave risk. Were you repaying a debt or were you bargaining for a discount? It's repaying a debt in my opinion. It was about proving to my mother, proving to my father, proving to the love of my life in London who hasn't spoken to me for four years that I'm not a bad person. That child that stole credit cards and ran around like a fool is not me. I wanted to convince just those few last people in my life that believed in me that there was something to believe in. What do you want the Australian public to know that they perhaps wouldn't know about people who work in roles like yourself? I want the Australian government to know that we're cannon fodder, that they look for people like us, people that they can throw under the bus, people that they can discredit, people that they can just destroy at the click of their fingers. What message do you have for other human sources who might be in this predicament? I want you all to know they don't keep their promises. What's the ideal outcome? Walking out of prison with asylum, with diplomatic protection from the Hungarian state, because my life is at risk in both Australia, from the underworld, clearly, and from the United States authorities. What outcome is possibly achievable is extradition to Australia. Bring me home. Bring me home. If this program has raised concerns for you, you can contact one of these services.